Welcome everyone. I'm aware that I stand between you and the coffee, uh, but it has been fantastic to work on this project with uh, Carrie and her team uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and it's even more fantastic today. I'm learning so much being here. I've been asked to talk with you today about my work on children who got a poor start uh, and what we found when we followed them up uh, five decades later. And I'm going to end my talk by presenting some evidence that educating parents uh, may be able to improve child outcomes. So let's begin by focusing on one important kind of poor start in life. Young children who have difficulties with self-control. Now we're going to follow them up looking at outcomes of health and wealth and public safety. Here's a little outline of this 20, 22 minute lecture so you can see how we're progressing along towards the coffee break and the toilet. Uh, so I'd like to just begin by asking us today to think about why should we study self-control? Well, we should study childhood self-control because it predicts success and failure in adult life, and it does so above and beyond intelligence and family wealth. And this is really important because everyone already knows that success in life follows from high intelligence uh, and good family socioeconomic resources, but it's also known that it's proven very difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate the wide differences between people in their intelligence and their social class. Those have been uh, resistant to intervention. So in contrast, self-control skills are thought to be something that might be more malleable and teachable in the early years. So we asked our data, would teaching self-control to young children really improve important indicators of life success? Now, first I want to give you a little bit of evidence that self-control could really be malleable. Here on the left, in pink, you see the association between IQ test scores taken in childhood and again, taken again in midlife adulthood in our longitudinal study of a birth cohort. Um, so this pink uh, chart shows you the well-known stability of the IQ, but on the right in green is the association between self-control measurements over the same number of years in the same cohort from childhood to midlife. The measures in childhood and adulthood were matched as closely as possible. Uh, and what you see there is a person's rank on self-control looks far less stable over the typical life course. And this is without any intervention. It's just naturalistic shifts. Now, another reason I want to focus on self-control today is that historians tell us that it's far more important for our well-being than ever before in human history. And that's because of these reasons. We need our self-control to avoid becoming obese because we live in an era of ready food availability, to maintain our fitness because we have sedentary jobs. We need to use our willpower to sustain our marriages because it's easier now to get a divorce than ever before. We need our willpower to prevent addiction because our, we live in an era of easy access to addictive substances. We need our self-control to resist overspending uh, because of the sophisticated internet marketing that comes at us constantly and to save for our old age because we live, unfortunately, in an era with no guaranteed pensions. So next I'll tell you a bit about the Dunedin study because it's one of our um, favorite research tools. And to do that, we need to travel to New Zealand uh, where we began our work on self-control. Okay, this is a design of the study. Uh, we study all babies born in one city in one year, 1972-73. Uh, and if you look at the top, you see there were 1,037 of them at the start of the study back in the 70s. And looking down the left-hand side, you see each age that the study members have come into our research unit, and they stay for a full day of private clinical assessments, tests, examinations, and interviews and observations. And down at the bottom right, you 
see that by 2019, 94% of this cohort were still taking part in the data collection. So this is a cohort that does not suffer from healthy volunteer bias in any way or from attrition bias over the years. So let's step back to the concept of self-control. We measured each child's self-control in the first decade of life by assessing these sorts of qualities. So the child is impulsive, can't wait their turn, has low frustration tolerance, dislikes effortful tasks, has fleeting attention, that kind of thing. Of course, you know that every child shows poor self-control at some point. We all know about the terrible twos. Um, and small children have really just not got much self-control compared to adults and teenagers. That's developmentally typical. So what we had to do to do this measurement is build a composite measure to assess whether each child was having self-control problems across the early years of the study and according to multiple reporters. So we had ratings that were made by our research staff after they worked with each child and by the child's parents and by the child's teachers. So when I talk today about poor self-control, I don't mean just a single instance or a temper tantrum. I mean that this is a child who showed a pattern of poor or good self-control along a dimension that held across many different situations and persisted across the early years. So now, what are the consequences of poor childhood self-control on this measure? We want to now fast forward 30 years. The first thing we studied was health outcomes. So when the study members were in their late 30s, age 38 to be exact, uh, the study participants visited our research unit and we assessed their health using a full day of different medical tests and examinations. I'll just show you a few. We have cardiovascular fitness on a bike, uh, anthropometrics, um, lung function assessment, uh, and everybody's favorite, the dental examination. We also draw lots of blood for laboratory tests. So to make uh, one measure that would summarize their health for this talk, we counted up whether the study member had clinically abnormal levels at age 38 on metabolic abnormalities, and that includes obesity, periodontal disease, sexually transmitted infections, elevated uh, systemic inflammation levels in blood, and respiratory difficulties. So this next slide is going to show you poor childhood self-control was linked to the number of these clinical level health problems each study member already had by age 38. Now I'm going to explain how to read this, this chart because you'll see more of these. Across the bottom of the chart, uh, there's the cohort of 1,000 children are divided into five groups from low self-control on the left to high self-control on the right. Each of the darkish bars represents a quintile group then that uh, contains 200 children. The height of the chart indicates the number of health problems that I just showed you. And what I want you to really notice here is the gradient shape of the bar. The poorer the children's self-control on the left, the more adult health problems they had by age 38. Keep an eye on this gradient. We're going to see it over and over in my talk. And I think it's really important for the work that you're going to be able to do here today in our breakout groups. We also looked at measures of wealth. Um, we started first with the standard indicators in most cohort studies. That's income and prestige of their occupations. And we found that children with poor self-control were earning less money than their more self-controlled peers uh, by the time they were 38. That's the light blue line. And their occupations were also less skilled and less prestigious. That's the dark blue line. We interviewed each study member about financial planfulness for the future. We asked questions like, uh, is saving for the future important to you? Do you find yourself living from paycheck to paycheck? Uh, and then we interviewed them also about their building blocks uh, for their financial future, such as home ownership, investments, or having a retirement plan. 
Children with less self-control when they reached their late 30s were less oriented towards saving. They had accrued fewer assets as building blocks for their financial future. And finally, in the finance domain, we looked at their credit ratings. Now, the range of credit ratings is from 100 to 1,000. 700 is a good rating. Um, below 700, you'll have difficulty getting credit without clear collateral. Not just borrowing money for a house or a car or to start a business, but even getting a mobile phone contract and what you're charged for that. More uh, low self-control children found themselves already at age 38 with a credit rating that cuts them off from access to capital. We looked also in the domain of crime. And we looked at study members' court convictions uh, at all courts in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, and we did that by linkage to the central computer system of the New Zealand police. And this shows you the percentage of the cohort members in our sample who have been convicted of one or more crimes by age 38. So as adult, children with poor self-control were more likely to have been convicted of crimes. We looked at their parenting because we were um, interested if poor childhood poor self-control has intergenerational effects. By their late 30s, 75% of the study members had become a parent already. And when any study member has a first child who reaches the age of three, we carry out a home visit, and during that visit, we videotape parent-child uh, interactions in standardized developmental paradigms, send those videotapes away to a team of experts in parenting who code the videos for qualities of good parenting. The less self-control in childhood translated directly to less skilled parenting when the study members grew up and had their own child. They were less warm toward their toddler, less sensitive to their child's needs, and they provided a less stimulating environment for child development. Once again, this follows that gradient. Now, you're probably saying to yourself at this point, you know, just a minute, I'll bet the reason that poor self-control seems to make such a big difference is because children with poor self-control tend to come all from poor homes, or they all have low intelligence, or they are all boys, or they probably are all diagnosed with ADHD, and if we just give them some Ritalin, it'll sort this out. Um, uh, these were my explanations. Uh, we tested them. They didn't explain the facts. The self-control gradient is the same among children from high-income families, children with above-average intelligence test scores, girls, and when we excluded all of the 60 children in the cohort who had a diagnosis of ADHD. These gradients that I have shown you today also are statistically adjusted for the family's social class and the child's IQ. So these gradients are over and above the contributions of family background and intelligence to midlife outcomes. Now, as our cohort has gotten older, we've begun to study how they vary on the pace of biological aging. And there isn't time for me to present uh, all the findings to you today, and they're quite complex, but I wanted to show one simple uh, outcome that's a good illustration. So after we got all these findings from age 38, we followed up the cohort at age 45, uh, and what you see here are photos, they're digital composites created of 10 women and 10 men taken near their 45th birthdays when they came into the unit. They look pretty young here. But these study members have, are the same chronological age, born in the same year. Now, we found the same gradient described the association between self-control and facial aging. The lowest self-control quintile of children that you see there on the left looked 5.8 years older than the highest self-control children. Uh, and this was having their faces, fo facial photographs, rated by raters who were kept blind to the fact that all of the 938 photographs that they saw were people born in the same year. 
Now, I want to tell you a little bit about how we isolate self-control as the active ingredient here. Now, I mentioned that in the Dunedin study, we use statistical controls for family, social class, and income to show that a child's self-control was important beyond his or her family income. But there's a lot more to family life than just money, as this group knows very well. So we wanted another way to isolate self-control as the active ingredient. And the best way to do that is to look within a family. So you can compare two siblings. Sibling one there at the top is the one with the poorer <laughs> self-control. In theory, that sibling ought to be at higher risk for poor later outcomes versus the other sibling, number two, who has relatively better self-control, who's shown at the bottom. So the big question for this research design is, do these two children in the same family have different outcomes even though they grow up in the same home with the same parents? And this question gives me an opportunity to tell you about our other longitudinal cohort. So we're going to leave New Zealand now and travel back here to Britain. And in the 1990s, when I first arrived at King's College London, we began a new longitudinal study. It's the same model as the Dunedin study, but this time with twins born in 1995. It's called the Environmental Risk Study. Uh, we enrolled a national sample of 1,100 twin pairs, uh, and here you see them on their first day of school in 1999. Um, we measured both twins on self-control when they were five-year-olds, and we used exactly the same measurement approach as I told you about before with the Dunedin study, uh, interviewing their parents, their teachers, and our staff uh, research workers. So now we'll fast forward to their adolescence. We compared the fraternal twins on problem outcomes when they reached secondary school age. And we chose to look at school failure because it's the best predictor we have of adult wealth. And we looked at cigarette smoking because it's the best predictor we have of adult health. And we looked at juvenile delinquent offending uh, in the police national computer because it's the best predictor of adult crimes. On average, what we found is the twin with the lower self-control at age five had more of these kinds of problems in secondary school. And you see that in the left-hand bar. Now, despite that they have this difference, despite having grown up in the same home, with the same parents, in the same neighborhood, in the same school, and for virtually all of them, in the same classroom. And they were the same age and sex. We added statistical controls here for any differences between the two twins in their initial birth weight and their IQ scores. So it's not just the family into which you're born that matters for a good life. It's whether you're able to develop self-control in the early years that counts as well. Now, many people ask me what could be done to improve the outcomes of children who get a poor start with low self-control. So now I'd like to tell you swiftly about the Danish Register study uh, we've done in which uh, education appears to disrupt the intergenerational transmission of continuity of a poor start. So to do this, we have to leave the UK and travel to Denmark. Lots of moving around here today. Um, we use the terrific national registers that are available to us in Denmark to define a population of families to study who has very strong policy relevance. So what we did was we identified high rate users on the registers of health care, social welfare benefits, and <coughs> crime. Um, and these registers are shown at the top of the slide there. Um, and by, when I mean a high rate user, I mean the same name shows up in many of these different registers and for a long number of years or more you know, frequently, uh, um, more and more often. So the same person is a high rate user. We looked at Danes who were high rate users among the 420,000 grandmothers and 400,000 grandfathers. That's generation one. Their children then 
650,000 people born in 19, between 1974 and 84, and they now grew up to be parents. That's generation two. And then we searched the Child Protective Regist Services Register for the 628,000 grandchildren that were born to those parents, and they were born between 1988 and 2016. So that's generation three. Now you're probably wondering what appearing on a Danish national register for health and social services has to do with a poor start in life from low childhood self-control. And this slide I'm showing you makes that link. We were able to make that link back in New Zealand in the Dunedin cohort because we could search the same national registers uh, in New Zealand um, but uh, for the people who were members of our birth cohort. And we found that the less self-control a Dunedin study child had in the early years, the more national registers they appeared on as a high rate user when they were in their 40s. Uh, on the right, you see that the children with the lowest self-control in the early years on average appeared on three or more of those national uh, health and social services registers and at a high rate. So this is the same kind of group that we studied in Denmark. So back to Denmark, we found that if a grandparent appeared at a, as a high rate uh, user on health and social registers, the parent was nine times more likely to be high rate Two. That's a connection from generation one to generation two. If a parent was high rate on the registers, the grandchild was four times more often found on the child protection register. And even across all three generations, if the grandparent was a high rate user of health and social services, their grandchild was twice as likely to be found on the child protection register. That's a leap of generations from generation one to generation through three. So very strong intergenerational continuity. Then we ask if education could disrupt this continuity. We did this by comparing Danish generation two adult siblings who are both parents, but who differed on the amount of education they got. And we could do this because 25% of Danes don't complete secondary school. And in fact, these adult siblings in the national uh, data set did differ quite a lot on their level of education. So we compared generation two parents who completed secondary school to their generation two brother or sister who left school early. And we found that education generation two parents were three times less often to appear as a high rate user on the health and social welfare and crime registers. And their generation three grandchild was three times less often to appear on the child protection register. So this was the sibling design. It's important because both of these sibling parents came from the same family background of risk and they differed only on the level of secondary schooling they completed. Uh, some points for this talk for discussion. So young children's problem behaviors such as low self-control may be more amenable to change than their IQ or family social class. For some people, Childhood problem behaviors left unaddressed can have consequences that last all the way into the middle of the life, of course. Uh, problem behaviors can also lead to continuity across generations of a family, as shown in excess reliance on public services. But even within the same family, this continuity can be disrupted and the children's outcomes can be improved through better education for parents. Now, today, I've talked about the Dunedin and ERIS studies because they illustrate what unhappy outcomes might befall some children who get a poor start in the early years. And my point of doing that is to illustrate that there is urgent need for intervention. As Felicity said, I'm preaching to the choir here, but just to establish kids don't grow out of this. You know, it's you don't be put off by people who say, just leave them alone and they'll turn out fine. That's not correct. Um, I also talked about the Danish study because it gives us an example of how child outcomes could be deliberately improved via a systematic change uh, such as better secondary education for parents. 
Now, among all the different topics that I study, I chose to present this narrative today because it, it brings in three different countries. You notice that although I'm American born, I don't present data from the United States. It's too depressing. So <laughs> if you have anything that, that gives you encouragement today, um, uh, it's that you're doing better than the United States, miles better. Um, but it brings in three different countries. Uh, we also benefit from the strengths of the longitudinal cohort design. Uh, the research benefits from the strengths of national register data linkage. And it benefits from the strengths of the sibling comparison design. So this is all observational research. We can't prove causation, but this gets as close as it's possible to causal inference, and that's the ess essence, really, of the Nuffield science culture. So if you want to know more about this research, this is our new book. It's called The Origin of You, and the central message of every chapter in this book is that a poor start in the early years is never, ever deterministic. In fact, our effect sizes are um, not that strong, which suggests that most children are changing and improving as life goes on. Thank you very much.